भागवते वासुदेवाया ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया Live from Long Beach Island, this is Wisdom of the Sages, a daily spiritual podcast with your host, Raghunath. And because Stuba's on vacation today, it is it is uh, interview day. Exciting. And we've got some special guests. Before we um, get into them, Mara, what's coming up on our schedule today, this week? We have our Wisdom of the Sages retreat coming up. Columbus Day weekend. If you haven't signed up for that, it's getting filled quick. It's we're going to do that at Super Soul Farm, and we're looking forward to seeing everybody. I'm here live. I'm having a, I've been having a whirlwind uh, weekend in New Jersey and Philly, and we just had a big Kirtan six hour program yesterday in uh, Marlton, New Jersey. Um, incredible people, and I got to see a lot of others, a lot of Zoomers, and uh, yeah, it's just I'm I'm. I'm excitingly exhausted and exhausted in a wonderful way. And now we're here like live, live with about 40 or 50 people here at Yoga Bohemia. Say Harry Bull, everybody. Yeah, we got a, a great group of yogis here. I love coming back to this place. I have great memories bringing my kids here. And, um, and this is a great yoga studio. If you're ever in the Jersey beach area, Yoga Bohemia is incredible on Long Beach Island. And I want to thank them for, Hosting wisdom of the sages. Um, let's dive right in. Uh, our our guests are the cre- co creators of. By the way, I've seen all these movies with my children: Sea Spiracy, Cow Spiracy, and What the Health. Um, great movies, but this new one is called Christ Spiracy. It divulges findings that are plausibly the most important discovery about Christ since he was crucified. The film is a fascinating investigation that will change the way you think about faith, ethics, and a relationship with animals. Kip Anderson and Cam Waters embark on a global quest sparked by the not-so-simple question, is there a spiritual or ethical way to kill an animal? Along the way, they discover what could be the biggest cover-up in the last 2,000 years. Kip and Cam, welcome to the show. Honored to have you. you guys. Thanks Thank for having you. us. Yeah. So my name is Raghunath. I've been a huge fan of what you guys have done, but it wasn't until our mutual friend Greg uh, introduced me to you guys that, you know, you watch a movie, but you never think, I never think about like who's making this, who's behind it, but it's so good to see the faces behind it. There's certain things I love to watch as family movies. Of course, my kids want to watch, you know, Shrek and stuff like that. I'm like, well, let's watch What the Health. Let's watch, you know, maybe this one will be a good family movie. And they all get into it, though. They appreciate it. And I, the last one we saw that you guys did was Sea Spiracy. And I tell you, I've been a vegetarian slash vegan since I was a teenager. Um, and um, I was always interested in spirituality. And I got turned on to exactly what you guys are doing when I was 18 because I felt like, man, there must be within spiritual circles, there must be an idea of, re- you know, uh, uh, controlling your tongue just to eat whatever you want. And you hear about gluttony and lust and things like that. And I found this book that really turned me on called Food for the Spirit by Stephen Rosen. And that book really opened me up how how there is some type of dietary restrictions in all world religions. And the idea is that, hey, Christ was the Prince of Peace. You know, I, I can't see him thumbs upping, you know, a Sacramento slaughterhouse or something like that. And so when I heard about your movie, it reawakened all these feelings I had as a teenager and um, especially when I, when I was younger, I was in a band and this band, we propagated this whole thing of animal rights and, and um, you know, it was trying to give a voice to the voiceless. And now the community, it's in the converse. It wasn't really in the conversation. We had a weird subculture of punk rock and hardcore music, but now it's such a huge conversation. People pull up to, 
uh, Burger King and say, well, what are your vegan options? And so you guys have come at a time where it's necessary. And I just want to appreciate you and give a lot of props to what you're doing right now because you're really speaking to the people in a very broad way. Thank you so much. No, thank you very much. It's super, super kind to you. And um, uh, Kip, you want to talk a little bit about the um, about the previous films you've done just to just to up, update the listeners that don't know about them. Uh, maybe yeah. starting. Do you mind doing that first? Yeah, for right. sure. Yeah, it gives context to this film actually. Yeah, That's so the great. first film was actually believe hard to believe it's ten years ago. It was called Cowspiracy. And that explores the the environmental impacts of raising and killing around you know land animals close to nine billion seven to nine billion land animals and trillions and trillions of fish every year, mm -hmm. which is the equivalent of 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 raising and destroying the entire human population uh, ten times every single year, and the environmental impacts of that, which is just destroying our resources, uh, our wildlife, our water resources, um, rainforests, on and on and on. Hmm. Um, and then the next one was the exploration and uh, into finding out what is the health impacts of the amount of animal products we consume: meat, dairy, fish. And that's what the health, that's a really powerful one. And then this is the third part of the chapter. And then Seaspiracy was on um, kind of a diversion of Cowspiracy. We had a mini part of Seaspiracy in Cowspiracy, and that's the environmental impacts of the fishing industry, of what, the, what it, it is. If I could butt in one second. When Seaspiracy came out, I was like, mm, are these guys beating this with a stick? I mean, we already heard the other two. But and then when I watched Sea Spiracy, I was like, "Oh my God, this is a whole nother thing." Everybody's got to watch Sea Spiracy. So, yeah, um, yeah <laughs> if, if maybe you're giving up meat, but you still eat fish, and here we are in Long Beach Island, is probably the land of, you know, game fishing and things like that. Very, very important, especially the types of people who like to fish. They also love the ocean and the sea. Generally, it's not like they're just evil trying to stab fish in the water and kill dolphins. But it's a it's a huge industry and it becomes really really uh um it can become really evil and really detrimental to the environment sorry to butt in i have a tendency uh, to yeah that's a really really important it's a really important film too even since it came out like on the discussion of climate change and the impacts of what the ocean has um you know to the other world the entire environment of of, of climate change and all that but anyway it's a great 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 film and then this one is essentially the third chapter of the 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 environmental health and ethical side of the conversation of what it is to 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 raise and kill and eat animal flesh and kill animals Mm -hmm. And this discovers, you know, we 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 go into all different angles of every single religion, even though it's called Christ spiracy. It was originally called cow spiritual, and it just explores the ethical uh, impacts of of what it is to eat or not eat. And then mm -hmm. we, as we dove deeper in, we found this this um, essentially a cover up of Jesus and the Nazarene movement. That's historically documented. And what, how that relates to animals, and if they, not only did they eat or, you know, kill animals. On the flip side, were they full, you know, one of the OG animal activists, and and did not kill, and were were very, very adamant about protecting, and treating all life as equal, and thou shalt not kill to not include just humans. Thou shalt not kill includes all sentient beings, mm -hmm. and when you look at the root of all religions they all connect at a certain point and it connects at compassion for all beings. And that includes all animals. Um, so kind of given some away, but that's kind of the context of, of, of Christ spiracy. Mm. Yeah. We're here in a yoga studio. And one, one of the principles of yoga is this concept of ahimsa or to, you can't take away all violence because just to drive here, I'm sure I ran over a toad or a few dragonflies, but the idea is, while we're here, minimize violence as best as you can. Yeah. And um, yeah, and you see this a lot in the spiritual traditions of India, which sometimes people ask me, well, how do you become a vegetarian or vegan? It's like, you know, I don't think I can do it, but you got cultures that did it for millennia. 
and um, have a refined. I mean, the Columbus went to looking for India just to learn how to cook and the spices. And um, so it's done. It's done in a cultured way. It's done in a nutritious way. There's uh, Ayurvedic medicine behind the idea of, uh, you know, a plant based diet. Yeah, um, the, the, I just want to the yoga, the yoga side of the conversation is pretty dear to me because I'm a certified Kundalini yoga teacher and Jiva Mukti yoga. I don't know if you're, you're friends with yeah. uh, Sharon and David. I'm friends with Sharon and David. Yeah, and that's like years. my my root of who of mine. And so you know, with it with the with the Ahimsa, it's the first limb of the yamas, and a lot of people think, oh, you know. I have to eat meat or dairy because I need to first be compassionate with myself. The yamas are how you treat others. The sure. niyamas. So if you're you're following the yamas and it's ahimsa, and that's the first of all the eight limbs, the first of the first, um, and to consider yourself a yogi, it's how you treat others. So when you use the, you know, I'll say excuse, but the rationale that like, oh, I have to eat meat or dairy because it's ahimsa to myself. It's actually, that's not how ahimsa uh, is properly used. It's others. So. Sure. It, it, we, the problem is we get, we take things the way we want to take them yeah. and not take them how they were actually taught oftentimes. Um, so I, I was thinking uh, what the health, um, cowspiracy, seaspiracy, I, I I can see it probably. Um, I, first of all, I'd like to know with those three movies, what was the feedback? Do you feel like you changed people's hearts and changed people's minds? Or was it preaching to the converted? Did, did you feel like you made headway? Yeah, it was massive headway. I feel with Cowspiracy, it was 10 years ago. At that time, it was no one knew the environmental impacts of animal agriculture. And then it's kind of like, you know, when movements start, either, um, you know, they get laughed at, then they got, they, I can't remember, it's, they, they, they get laughed at, then they get ridiculed, then they eventually gets accepted. At that time, it wasn't even a conversation. And then, um, so now it's, you know, it's, it's everyone knows at least some, whether you agree with it or not, the impacts of climate change and environmental destruction in the rainforest. So that was really a, a launch pad for that whole conversation. And then what the health came at a time where it was kind of the same thing. Mm. Um, you know, I've been vegan for 18 years and back then I didn't even know it was healthy. I pur purely did it for the animals. Mm. And then I found out, wow, this is incredibly healthy. I feel amazing. And so when that film came out, it exploded and it, it, it got, it carried, we, we got invited to the NAACP as one of the best films of the year, because for some reason it got into a whole realm of all these athletes in the inner city and and um because there's a there's a notion of of racial of racial nutrition and um it's a really fascinating story where it not only talks about the health of personal health but like society's health and what the impacts that does on on everyone involved so that is a huge um you know lewis was uh, lewis hamilton the, the race car driver tom ford the uh, fashion uh, fashion star stopped doing leather because of the film. A lot of a lot of celebrities went vegan because of it, and it's had a lot of uh, a lot of impact. And then Sea Spiracy, as you know, went massive, massive, massive a couple of years ago. And so these are seeds that are planted. Sometimes they they go huge, and then you kind of don't see them for a while. Sure. And then it comes, and then like, and so I feel with this film, it's the perfect timing because it discovers the ethical and spiritual angle of all this, where kind of blows the lid out of everything else and like okay now let's get into the spiritual side of this and you're planting a seed that doesn't necessarily uh you know it's sort of like a, a century plant or an agave it's sort of like it grows it grows it grows and then at one point it just shoots yeah. and so that could happen in 10 years from some influencer watching the film and then that guy is has so much influence these things can th these things that you're putting out they can change the world in a small way or in a massive way. And it's got nothing to do with time necessarily. These things, your, your films are out there and they're always going to be changed. They're going to be changing people's lives um, for generations. So um, there's a great appreciation for what you do. Thanks. Now my, my next thing, and I would like to bring Cam in the conversation because Cam was, he grew up. You sort of look like a country boy, Cam. Are you a country boy? <laughs> <laughs> at heart, at heart, yeah. <laughs> where where'd you sure. grow up? Um, I grew up in Augusta, Georgia, which is about two hours outside of Atlanta, where the Masters Golf Tournament is held. Um, yeah, but it's also the capital of the Southern Baptist Convention, the biggest Christian organization behind the Vatican. 
and you grew up in Christian family, Christian values, yeah. Christian Christian music. Right? Yeah, 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 big sure. time gospel music. My grandfather, who was like the spiritual patriarch of the family, he was a music minister and founded a church off the back of the quote unquote Jesus movement in the 70s, the kind of hippie style yeah. of the whole thing. Um, and then beneath him, you know, my mom and all, all my family were some way involved in either music ministry or just ministry itself. Mm. And then when I became, you know, of age, um, and, and started figuring out what I wanted to do, I, I really took, you know, took it on as well and made music in my teens and all the way through my twenties, uh, professionally, actually as a gospel musician. Okay. And you were, you were like a signed musician professionally. Yeah. 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 So that, um, that was uh, my life. I grew up also Italian Catholic family, and I had a, you know, Italian diet. That means we <laughs> had meatballs, <laughs> meatballs yeah, yeah. on Sunday. And it was almost a sign of you made it. Yeah, my parents grew up in the Depression. My parents are older. You know, they, they grew up in the Depression. And the fact that you could actually purchase meat, that means you've made it out of the ghetto, so to speak. And so my father's thing was, we're going to meet, eat meat every day because, yeah. you know, I've been responsible enough. I've paid my dues. Now we can afford to meet, eat meat. And so it was not only going against my Italian family. They felt almost, I feel, I'm, 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 can't, I'm just speculating, but I feel like they felt like I was going against family values when I had to get up on Thanksgiving Day and say, you know what? I don't do this anymore. I mean, yeah. no one really cared when I made that announcement. They're like, I don't care more for me, you know, but, uh, um, but that was my statement. I had to make that statement. Uh, I don't think anyone's followed me on that path in my big Catholic Italian family, but, uh, nonetheless, I grew up with the attachment to meat. I liked the, I liked the taste of meat, but I, I like Kip was saying, I, I had to give it up for ethical reasons. It was, the voice was too loud in my ear. And so um, how did you uh, how did you do it in Augusta, Georgia, with a uh, uh, with a family of gospel singers who were like probably making fried chicken and chitlins? And I don't even know what chitlins are, but <laughs> but tell me your story, how you dealt with it. Go, going against a family is almost, it's almost like it hurts them. Mm -hmm. Was it like that for you or were they all like, you're right, we should follow you. Cam. Uh, well, believe it or not, most of them on my mom's side are um, actually all on the path now and, right. and totally, totally into it. But I mean, it did take time, you know, with with, you know, some of them were quicker than others. And then on my dad's side, not as much. But, um, you know, and I think, too, just before I even get into that, I think it's important to note, you know, Kip was born not far from where I was born, too. So he's a no, Southern really. boy at heart. And he he uh, but I mean, both of us, I know he has the same story where we similar. We grew up loving meat dairy fish you know all of that uh loving the taste of it and enjoying it um i was actually part of my backstory is that i was a part of a christian youth hunting club hunting and fishing club and we actually explore that again in the film um we go wow. and revisit my club and my old mentors and go out on a hunt with a um with a with a young boy um, really, 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 really powerful moment of the film. But, uh, but yeah, when, when I started kind of questioning things, um, for me, it really started actually with a spiritual kind of question, uh, funny enough. And it was when I did the Daniel fast, which I don't know if you've heard of that, but you know, I Catholics, haven't. so Catholics have Lent, right. And similarly, um, not all Protestants, but the only thing that's kind of close to it in, in the Protestant land is uh, this thing called the Daniel fast, and it models mm. the biblical prophet Daniel, who in the scripture it says that when he's enslaved in Babylon uh, during that period when the Hebrews were were enslaved, he refused to eat the meat that was being offered to him in the kingdom and uh, or, or by the king Nebuchadnezzar, and only ate vegetables. And then mm. you know they were mad at him for doing that, but they they allowed a test, and after ten days he tested healthier, stronger and wiser than everyone else in the kingdom. Mm. And so it's this little blip in the, in the scripture of that. And um, a lot of Protestants started doing it because it became kind of almost like a fad diet in it more, more than anything. Right. Uh, but it was meant to be kind of this Lent type, you know, draw closer to God, almost like a fast, you know? Um, so I did that when I was in my late teens and it was really hard because I was working at a barbecue restaurant <laughs> at that time. Yeah. 
Yeah. So um, that that started it where I I noticed the benefits of my health. I noticed the benefits of of a you know heightened kind of spiritual connection. Um, and then my mom was going through some similar changes because she was doing it with me, and she was an insurance sales lady and audited a chicken farm um, in South Carolina saw the battery cages and came home and started throwing chicken out of our uh, house in the trash. Wow. And, uh, and my, my stepdad at the time owned the barbecue restaurant that I worked at. And so it created a lot of, a lot of family drama. And, uh, and basically, yeah, it just, that was the, that was the beginning of it. You know, I didn't instantly go, you know, vegan at that point or anything, but it started the journey and the questions and really a lot of what this film is about, which is exploring that tension of one's ethical, position especially influenced by the dominant religion of your culture and so that's a big part of the film is you know kip went through all the previous films and how you know environment health but what really makes those previous films fascinating i think too is that it explores how the nonprofit organizations of those issues uh, oh, environment yeah. and health they're supposed to be the ones telling us what the best choices are. However, they're actually doing the opposite because they're receiving backdoor, you know, uh, money Big and backs. all these things. Yeah. Yeah. And so they're all compromised. Right. I, right. I had cam, I had heart palpitations this week and I had to go to the doctor and check out and I'm sitting in the waiting room and what is in the waiting room free of charge slush puppies. Is that what they're called? Slush puppies. It, it's like a, do you know what that is? It's an yeah. it's slush East coast. It's, a, it's like a slushy. Oh, they're yeah, just yeah. handing out to the kids. There was some right. other, and and then uh, at the hospital there was just like one junk food machine after another. And they're such. All the doctors were incredibly out of shape. All the doctors, I was like, I'm I'm listening to this guy for advice on my health and my heart, and I was like, well, are they? How are they pulling it off? If I'm feeling if I'm feeling ill right now, how are they pulling it off? And so it, 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 there's some type of divorce from the idea of what you consume affects your body in the medical industry. I, I think you painted it out really well. And it seems like whether it's cancer, diabetes, it, it's like these it, it feels like they're compromised in what they're doing. It's like uh, the, 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 the um, fox is guarding the hen house or something. Right. Uh, um, and uh, I, I think uh, Kip could probably even sh share more about that if you want. I know my son has type one diabetes um, and uh, it was, it's been a real hassle for him. And the more we looked into it, the more they deal with managing diabetes than trying to find a cure. It's, it, it, it's horrible to say, but it's not in someone's best interest to cure it because they built an entire business on managing it. If you cure it, all your shareholders lose everything. And I don't like to think of conspiracy this, conspiracy that, but it's just sort of a dollars and cents game when you have, yeah. in, when it becomes a business and an industry. Yeah. And it's, you know, even though they're at the end of each, uh, the film or, or not what health, but they're, you know, conspiracy kind of conspiracy. Uh, but the, you know, when you can see an actual, like for what the health, like what you're referring to, that's what we explore there. There's direct connections every single thing time you see these studies about eggs, about cheese, and it looks like it's good. You just follow the follow the follow the trail and it goes back to some in industry funded um, study. And it's time and time again, like the, all of these films that we've worked on have been bashed in trying to put under the grinder from the animal agriculture industry, from the pharmaceutical and time, it stands the time, you know, it's like for a little while, it looks like, oh, that what the hell, that was false. And then a couple of years later, like, oh, actually, every single, every single fact in that is true. And what they tried to fight it with was an industry funded story. And um, so this one's an interesting one because it's not so much factual uh, data like that as the other films, but it's more of a philosophical one, which for mm -hmm. me is most interesting. And then also to the health, you know, there's mind mind body and spiritual health and for me you know i feel that's the most fascinating too and, and there, there's a reason why i just want that at the very end of the film the greatest thinkers and most influential people of their our history buddha jesus uh you know more recently tesla gandhi uh um leonardo da vinci all of them were at some point vegetarian slash vegan it's kind of the same back then 
And there's a reason for that. There's something that that opens up and clears away like kind of black matter that you don't really fully relate to as you as your ethical eight-year-old person inside that you have to do mental gymnastics around. And when you can remove that, you tap into that greater one, I feel. But there's a reason for um, all these incredible masters throughout history uh, following that same path. Well, I feel like if I Google up the health benefits of red meat, I can find a lot of information <laughs> to endorse it. The health benefits of chicken, eggs, and dairy. You can always you can always Google up something to endorse whatever you believe in and want to believe in. And that's why I think Christspiracy is important because now it's bringing up this next thing. Forget what the experts are saying. What do you think about this? And I think Cam brings that up in the in the trailer. Um, where you just asked the question, is there an ethical way to kill an animal? Um, and how do you deal with that? And I love your story about going to the Christian hunting club because I had a similar situation when I was growing up. The thing that made me feel most grounded in life was waking up early, going out by myself into the forest where no one's around, the sun is just rising, and I'd wade in the water and I'd go fishing. And that became this grounding impression in my consciousness that it's peaceful, it's uh, natural, it's beautiful. And look, I just caught this yellow perch. The perch is gorgeous and yellow. And I put it on a stringer and I brought it back home and I cooked the, I cooked the fish. So to me, that was like, that was the most pristine thing in my life. And it wasn't until I was a teenager when I just said, you know what, I'm gonna stop eating red meat and chicken, and um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna just just fish because fishing is sort of natural. And I started touring punk bands and punk clubs in America and Europe, and I thought, man, I'm sick of this dirty punk music and the atmosphere and the environment. When I go home visit my mom, I'm gonna go fishing. And in that one year of that restricted diet, um, went camping. I was gonna live off the land. And I just started bringing my fishing tackle and went fishing. And because of that one year of consciously choosing, I'm not going to eat for ethical reasons, it killed me to even put a worm on the hook. I was just like, I can't do this. This worm is struggling. I, I never noticed this before. It was just, it was like, it was always struggling, but I, I'm noticing it for the first time. And then I caught my first fish. I did it anyway. I just had to like stick my ethics in the ground a second this is natural this is good people have been doing this forever jesus did this everybody did, everybody's <laughs> fish i'm gonna catch caught a fit caught a largemouth bass reeled it in and i looked at that fish put it on the stringer the next fish i caught the treble hook went through the eyeball there was no gentle way of taking that out without tour tour and the fish you could see is in pain and i've had friends that say oh they don't feel pain they're fish they don't they don't get pain I was like, it's flapping like it's out of control. It's It feels something. <laughs> and that was when I realized I just can't do this anymore. And it, 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 and it, and it took that. And so it, it, it's interesting, like hunting, you know, a lot of times I know hunters and, and they're, they're, they're good people with good hearts, but there's some type of disconnect. And a lot of times they'll say, I love hunting because I love deer and deer are such beautiful animals. You want to share anything about about that disconnect people have? I'll I'll share one quick then, Kim. It was interesting because in Cowspiracy, if anyone's seen that, remember we go towards the very end where we say, well, maybe backyard farming is the 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 best environmental way to do it, and so we go to a backyard duck farmer <clears throat> to <clears throat> see him kill and you know a, a duck, and I wasn't really prepared. I didn't really think about it, and then we get there and we go in his house. And there are stuffed ducks everywhere. And he has these ducks in his backyard and he loves ducks. He's infatuated, like he right. genuinely. And then he goes and he kills one. And, you know, there's kind of, it's like, it's, you know, and then I ask him, I'm, I said, well, do you remember the first time you did this? And once I asked that question, it snapped back to when he was, I think, 12 years old. And you can watch the film. And there's this look in his eye. And that's who he truly is. And then he said it was really hard. And he kind of like had to snap back out of it because the connection to a lot of hunters is they love animals, they mm. love nature, but they don't, yeah. as a man, they don't know how to get close to an animal 
other than hunting or killing because that's the best way he can get close to ducks and have them mm -hmm. all around and it's really sad so one of the things we're working on is like having have I, I had the same story of you as fishing i grew up fishing in the shenandoah in, the, in virginia that was tough for me but i was doing fishing lines with little mini gopro like you know these new nano uh yeah things and then you're gonna feed the fish rather than kill the fish and you can say oh that's a big large amount of bath that's been and then with <laughs> oh, that's hunting, interesting yeah and then hunting we were gonna we were gonna we were gonna we still want to do this one it's having having a rifle with you know uh one of those long lenses but when you click it it's a you take a picture so you're having the same exact experience, but you know maybe it's a bear, and then you take a picture, and then you can see how tall it was, how big it was, and then the and bear you kills you. No. And you. Yeah, and the bear. <laughs> yeah, maybe not. Yeah, maybe not. Look, I'm gonna take a picture of this big. I'm gonna... And, and then, and then you could do like a 3D. You could do, yeah. <laughs> let's say a moose, and then you do a 3D <laughs> image of how big that was, and you can then like, here's the moose that I got. So there's other ways of getting close to it, but it, yeah, it, that's. It's or, almost like we have to capture it to appreciate it like we have to stuff stuff it like yeah. you said the stuffed ducks it's like see how beautiful this is it's like as humans it's almost like we have to catch the rainbow trout we have to shoot the polar bear and stuff it just so we can feel where the mink or the, the fur and yeah. it's and there's like an appreciation for it but it's almost like you don't have to pluck every flower to appreciate the beauty of a rose. You know, you don't have yeah. to pluck that rose. You can you can just accept that it's there and it's beautiful. And I like that idea of shooting with cameras, shoot yeah. or fishing to feed. That that yeah. uh, that is actually unbelievable. Never thought about That's that. That's a massive disconnect with serial killers. They when they I mean, you know, it's horrifying, but uh, you know, they especially the ones who actually eat that they they do they don't know Wait, what, how what? they're trying they try, i mean second. i'm trying to think of uh what's his name this guy but, is like cut from my cloth isn't he this yeah, is yeah. this is how i end up start our spiritual podcast usually it's got something to do with murder human trafficking uh but you know <laughs> serial killers yeah. thank you thank you kid. i don't feel so peculiar anymore it's, Welcome it's, to <laughs> it's crazy how this is all connected though some some i mean as horrific as, as raping and in and, and killing though that that they don't know how to connect to something else that they want to be close to. And sure. so there's a very similar, just twisted thing in hunting, fishing, and that that's, you know, similar. And I, I don't want, I, I didn't want to say that also, because it, it's sort of, it's very, it's very, very confronting. But if you think how we're doing it now, mm -hmm. that's what a sociopath does. A sociopath can kill someone and then he can go out and have lunch. He can have lunch with the, you know, the the brother of the person he killed and have a normal conversation. It's almost like they're creating two different types of brain, minds or intelligences. And um, that's the, the very definition of a sociopath. But we do it all the time. And we have dogs that we love and that we dress up and they there are lap dogs and we sleep with them and we uh, give them the highest quality dog food. It's, it's uh, uh, and then we have this other animal that's not far off from a dog. A pig is not far off from a dog, but this are this dog does this um, animal does not get a name. He does not get dressed up. No one's dressing up their pig for the most part, right? The pig is de-spiritualized. I don't want to say dehumanized because we're all spirits, but de-spiritualized, and it becomes like a commodity. So one is a commodity, and one is my best friend. And it's almost like we live in this like, and it and it, it's not us. It's cultures brought it upon us. If I leave my dog in the car in the summer in Long Beach Island with the windows up, I'm either going to get a fine or I'm going to get arrested, depending on your state's laws. You know, if the dog dies or something. But we'll wholesale, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, we'll give tax incentives to slaughterhouses and endorse it, and. It's a it's a much worse death because it's the entire lifetime of that animal that never sees the light of day often. It's totally. culture also that's also endorsing this. Yeah, I would I would add to that, too. It's funny earlier, Kip was talking about industry funded studies. And then I don't know if you noticed, Kip, but it might have been like a Freudian thing. The second time you said industry funded stories <laughs> and that kind of hit <laughs> oh, me because interesting. We have all these industry funded stories in our head, you know, that I think um, it's, it's, it's so difficult 
at times I've noticed for myself and others to really question these things. And often people can be shamed into, you know, questioning them because it's like, oh, you, you, you know, you don't have a heart. You, you, you got to see this animal has a soul, blah, blah, blah. But the problem is, is so many people have these stories rattling around in their heads that actually aren't even their own. Mm -hmm. And that's what we go into deeply in the film at both you know, even just this, just the ethical philosophical level, like what you're talking about, a, a pig versus a dog, say, you know, we're taught one is to be loved and one is to be eaten. Um, and we don't realize that, you know, those aren't our own thoughts. That isn't who we really are. Like Kip was saying with the duck hunter, you know, our innocence when we were a child at some point made that distinction to discriminate in that way. Um, and what we, again, explore in this film is that a lot of that too is heavily, heavily influenced um, or just directly, you know, the stories that are in our heads are partly our spiritual tr tradition too, because our spiritual, like I was saying before, who are the, you know, uh, American Diabetes Association is the nonprofit of, of, of a health, you know, situation that we got to understand, but who are the nonprofits of ethics? Where do we get that? That's typically our religious traditions, whether you're Christian or not, whether you're a yogi or not, whether you're Buddhist or not, um, whatever culture you grew up in, that moral tradition is, is embedded everywhere. You know, here in America, it's, it's, um, it's, uh, Christianity, it's on our money and God we trust, you know? So it's like, we really have to get behind all these aspects. So that's why in, in Christ spiracy, we go deep into the kind of scriptural and historical understanding of how these traditions came about and how they became intertwined with this killing industry um sure. and in fact one of the big ones you know without revealing too much is that long before american diabetes association and all of these uh things we had the temples and the temples which are these beautiful places for prayer and incense and everything had become massive slaughterhouses for animal sacrificial ritual which is the way that most people obtained meat back in those days because it was very hard to do so we explore and show that connection and and how it got there and then ultimately um, mm. what that led to with the manipulation of literal words of scriptures, mistranslations, all of these things that created these stories in our heads that we use to justify harming. Well, maybe we can tap into a little bit of that first because th the first point was step aside from religious scripture and how do you feel about it? Is is there a religious way? And it, 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 is there a, a spiritual way to kill an animal? And, and that makes us sort of what's the difference between a dog and a pig? And that makes us really talk to our heart and um and and perhaps shift what uh Kip was calling like opening a third eye towards it, um and, and becoming and sh having a total paradigm shift like the the duck the duck guy who goes back to his childhood and me seeing that treble hook in the eye and you have some paradigm shift you're like what have I been doing, but let's talk a little bit about and I, I'm I'm a little rusty on this because I, I I studied it for a while but I know that there were. Christian mysticism, who all uh, endorsed and supported this type of lifestyle. I think from Greek Orthodox, uh, there's so many restrictions on their diet. Uh, d d all, pr practically, for it's like dietary fast, dietary or uh, ethical fast, ethical fast, ethical fast. And then, of course, the Essenes. You want to talk a little bit about, um, without giving away, going into the whole film, but what were some big parts of um, Christ's teachings that maybe we're not popular by us by the Roman Catholic church or, or et cetera. Yeah. Well, I mean, what we, what we go into deeply in the film that I think is important to touch on because it's, it's, it's just such an exciting story, monumental um, history, you know, transforming is this story of the temple cleanse, which, you know, uh, is the most historically documented story from the life of, of Jesus, of Yeshua Christ. Um, and essentially, if you know it, maybe even just a remnant of it from the a couple times you've been to um, Easter service or something, if you if you don't go to church or whatever, it's it's the story that they usually tell around Easter. It's when Jesus goes into the temple, and the way it's told is that he gets upset that it's become a marketplace, and they're dealing and ch exchanging money, and he gets angry. And typically, most you know, when I was raised, 
the the you know the pastors they always put their twist on the story and what they believe it's meant to be telling us and so sure. they always say this this is what righteous anger looks like it it shows the one time when the peaceful guy goes in and gets upset and actually does something about it um and so he flips the tables and the money scatters everywhere and he says this house is meant to be a house of prayer but you've made it a den of thieves mm. well this film explores what was really happening in that temple what was actually going on uh, when he when it's claimed to be a marketplace and what Jesus really said when he said den of thieves, because it's actually a massive mistranslation and it completely shifts the entire meaning of the story and the act. Mm. And it opens this portal, like you said, to the Essenes, the Nazarenes, these original first century movements and groups that kind of got lost to history because of this rewriting of history and um and yeah so that's that's the foundation of the 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 christ story in the film but also well, like what was the marketplace what and and where did you find this out from um well i mean it's literally in the scripture itself which in the bible you know the oh. canonized bible that which i didn't you know i wasn't ever raised to really pay attention to but it says it right there it says that you know he goes in and releases the oxen and the doves that they're selling. And so what was happening is they, they were sell the marketplaces, they were selling animals for sacrifice, millions of animals uh, for the week of Passover and, and everything. And, and, you know, the film goes into what that really looked like. I think people just, no one's ever really been able to get a visual hmm. on the scene of what was really going on. They imagined like a church or, you know, maybe a little bit of a Roman structure, beautiful stone. And Jesus goes in and he sees a little bit of money and he gets pissed and flips sees it. Some, see some guy doing a foreign currency exchange. And I don't yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. We're supposed to pray. Yeah. yeah. And what I think if you go to these old world, you know, you go to Turkish, you go to these um, Thailand markets, Turkish markets, things like that. They still you can still go so it's like it, they're selling mangoes bananas and they're selling chickens and sheep and calf and stuff like that it's 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 part of traditions all over the world but yeah on the front of the church i could see yeah could and part particularly that's the thing though is in the in the in the scripture and you know just going and talking we in the film we talked to oxford theologians archaeologists um the guy who leaked the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is one of the most profound findings in the last hundred years of, of any scripture. And there's just this aspect that we've never really been told, at least I wasn't told going to church, about really what that scene was and that the the, the primary thing that was being sold were animals. And, mm. um, you know, that uh, that was the whole economy of Jerusalem at the time was was meat being sold off the back of the religious sacrificial system and what that really meant and um and and again too like i said the scene you know it's not this pristine you know beautiful roman rock building or whatever there is a there is a bloodbath going on and so we investigate the reality and the truth of that is that really true what's going on because it's presented you know at a, at a certain point in the film and we go into this almost like da vinci code indiana jones-esque exploration into the archaeology and the you know hidden texts and everything that we have available so um yeah it's it's profound it's they, they just they describe the temple you know historically that there was blood wading up to the knees that's how much bloodshed of killing was in this wow. temple and what's interesting about this act this that's massive activism act that jesus the only time jesus ever got super super angry is four days later he got crucified so when people it's a fun question why did jesus get crucified oh he was a martyr he was this he was that there's a specific act it was this act that led directly to his crucifixion. What sure. happened? What did he do? What was his motives? And it wasn't only him. It was him and his entire disciples and the Nazarene basically movement taking over this temple. It's a huge activism, which is essentially equivalent of today, taking down uh, the Vatican, the White House, the the Wall Street, all in one swoop. And what was mm -hmm. the main intention? So, yeah. Um, it seems like I don't know. Maybe it was just me when I when I started reading a few books like Peter Singer's book, Animal Liberation. When I was a teenager, I was like, OK, I'm, I'm open to this. This makes sense. But um, and it seems like your movies, too, could either change really influence the, your previous movies could really change people's hearts and minds. But it seems like you're directly attacking these institutions that 
know, again, have their basis in good and God and truth. And it seems like they're probably not going to buy anything that you say. Like, you know, it's not like, although I don't know, Cam told me, you know, you influenced your whole family. Maybe if, I don't know, is you think it's going to influence these, the, these institutions or where are you trying to go with it? Just people like us on the periphery, like, yeah, I'm sort of spiritual and yeah, that can't be wrong. Uh, how, how, how is there pushback from uh, big uh, Christian institutions? I, I'll say one quick. I think there's me a lot of pushback, but what 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 the beauty of this film is when you watch it, we're not like saying all these religions are bad as we're revealing the truth of the essence of Buddhism, the essence of yoga, because you know that's my personal way, the essence of Christianity. When you remove that, it's so gorgeous, it's so beautiful. And it like sure. it's like been covered up in mud and this like lotus flower rise, like, oh, that's what Christianity is, that's what Buddhism is. So at the core, that's our intention of this film. And so people who how are open to it and receive it that way, that's how they see it. They say, one of the biggest, we've done a lot of mini test screenings, and one of the biggest things that people say, or Christians, they've kind of walked away from their religion because they just, you know, it didn't feel right. They say, oh my God, after watching this film, I feel so closer to Jesus again. I feel like I've mm. got my friend back again. Now I see who he is, and that's that's really beautiful. That is a win. That is a win. <laughs> And, and obviously, yeah. the the you everyone on the periphery, like you said, we hope everyone just hops on board for sure. And but even though the 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 ones that you would imagine would be the farthest from this, again, like in test screenings, we've done small screenings and even individuals that I would say are like the most fundamental religious type of person they can be. And the beautiful thing is, even if they come out of the film after watching it, not fully agreeing with aspects of it, um, they always say they appreciate the approach because the film is about asking questions. It's just mm. starting a conversation. We're not, you know, Kip and I never like preach or say, you know, a statement. Like we're just asking really interesting questions. Some of them that haven't even really been asked before to certain people. Like we go to the Vatican and, you know, ask one of the, uh, the professors of philosophy there, how, how would Jesus kill an animal? Like literally what would he do? What do you um, say? <laughs> you got to see the it film, but it's, it's <laughs> funny. It's funny. So it's, you know, that's what it's all about. It, we, we just really wanted to, you know, genuinely that the driving force of the film is, is there a spiritual way to kill an animal? And we were always like, you know, between going to talking to professors to literally going to the premier uh, humane regenerative farm in Virginia, Joel mm -hmm. Saladin um, uh, polyface farms. We, we go there to see like, Hey, this is a small farm. You know, this guy's a Christian too. They call him the the high priest of the pasture or whatever because he's he himself is against the industrial system too, mm. um, and wants to change things. And so we even go there, like, hey, maybe we will, maybe we will find a way. You know, uh, the Dalai Lama eats meat. If he can eat meat, maybe there is a way to do this. So that's what the driving force of the film is, and I feel because of that. Yeah, like Kip said, it's not like it's directly threatening and try to tear down a religion. It's trying to get underneath what is the actual deep truth. Um, so, sure, yes. it's not like people who eat meat have all bad qualities at all. But it's almost like you're fine tuning your spirituality when you can start to see that connection between humans and animals and your pet and these so-called, you know the stock market, which is where this, the name came from. Yeah. The, the animals that are on the marketplace and fish and trees and forest. And if we can make that connection, what a different world it would be. And e e even if you are a spiritual person, how much deeper can your spiritual understanding be? Yeah. It seems like you might naturally want to move away from that. Uh, yeah. Anyway, can you guys share something about the, cause it's been a while uh, about the, um, uh, what was the scripture of oh, the Dead Sea Scrolls and how yeah. they connect to what you're talking about? Yeah. So um, in 1947, there were documents found near the Dead Sea. Uh, a couple of Bedouin shepherds were, I think, chasing around a goat, funny enough, that wandered out uh, out of their herd and into a cave. And uh, they threw a rock inside and heard a a shattering of a pot or something, and they went in and they found these just this labyrinth of all of these uh, pots containing scrolls in them, and mm -hmm. uh, it was 
monumental, monumental back then, um, caused a big stir. And of course, uh, the Vatican and some centralized authorities sent their people down there to scoop it all up and said, Hey, we're, you know, we, we got this, we'll tell you what it says, you know, what and, year ish uh, was that? That was 1947. Yeah. 1947. Okay. Yeah. And then a little bit after that, the Nag Hammadi texts were found, um, which they kind of lumped them together. Those were found in a graveyard in Egypt. Uh, but the bottom line is, yeah, we we interview a guy in the uh, in our film named Professor Robert Eisenman, who was the one who leaked those documents to the public, who was able mm. to put pressure on uh, those centralized authorities and say, hey, you can't do this. You can't have this this uh, hold on these texts. We we need to see what these say. You know, the professors got together and and everything. And so um, what we have is these these alternate texts, many of which all match and affirm aspects of the canonized scripture that we have, mm -hmm. but many that add a lot more context to the story, especially like historical context. And, um, you know, they, what we now know is that most of these texts reveal more about the actual first century movement post crucifixion mm -hmm. and what was really going on. And so that's what we talk about in in Christspiracy is there's there's this early movement often referred to um, as the Nazarenes in mm -hmm. these texts. That's where we get Jesus of Nazareth. We explore that in the film that that in itself is a monumental mistranslation of the Greek text Jesus of Nazareth. It it doesn't actually it's it's not actually translated that way. So we we talk about these Nazarenes, the Ebionites, which is the Hebrew word for poor, the poor ones, blessed are the poor. Um, and these texts that they had that show a whole other side of that mission and that movement that's heavily centered on this question around killing animals. So um, anyway, is yeah. it, it, this is they reference the Nazarenes and the Essenes as well, these yeah, communities, the which I think were like, were they raw foodists or they were they um, just simple vegetarians or vegans? Yeah, I mean, the text themselves, you know, they don't like give like recipes or anything like that. Oh, it's not um, a raw food cookbook here. The, un <laughs> uh, the uncooking no, is what, seen. Well, what we do, what we do have, I know from, you know, not only the discovery of those, but also the historical documentation from the early church fathers mm -hmm. and like historians like Josephus is that the Essenes, yes, th this group, and then the subsects, the Nazarenes and the Ebionites are like sub subsect groups of the Essenes. They all varied a little bit, but they all agreed on this thing, which was, you know, that they had a high regard for animal life and their diet, their, their dietary uh, choices followed that. I have to ask one more question because it's, a qu I think it's the first question that comes to people who grew up with the Bible what about the fish? Wasn't he a fish? What you know? Didn't he give out fish to everybody? Come on. Yeah, we we explored that in the film as well. And again, um, no matter which way you look at it, you know, if if you're a person that has a hard time with questioning any, you know, um, of the words of the scripture at all, and believe that it's one hundred percent God breathed, that there's no possibility that a human hand who were the people that wrote it, humans wrote it, but there's no, there's no chance that their own influence made it into the text. And there's a lot of people that believe that way. And that's one perspective um, that uh, even if you look at it like that, the stories themselves, you know, really show if you, if you read it uh, and don't just hear a preacher teaching it to you, if you read it, you see that the fish element is a little bit fishy. There's, there's something that's going on there that, that isn't, isn't quite right. I don't want to give too much away because I want you to see the film, but it's really oh, powerful. All right. Okay, good. Yeah. I thought it was a mistranslation too. That's what I yeah. remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's 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 a blatant number of mistranslations in those stories. Um, you know, for instance, uh John 21 is a famous one where, you know, it's Jesus has them cast the net to the other side and they catch more fish and everything. But the, the there's three different Greek words in that one paragraph translated as the word fish. And uh, two of them don't mean fish at all. And uh, one of them uh, even uh, it does. Yeah. So it's, yeah, we go into all that in the film very briefly. And we're going to, you know, this film is again, only just starting a conversation. So all of our content on our social media at Christspiracy, which, you know, we're, we're live on all social media. We're going to explore over time, even deeper, you know, with the way we're releasing this film, which I, you know, it'll, I'll be excited to talk about over time in this podcast. We're doing this whole pay it forward model. And we, mm. there's all of this extended content and deleted scenes that we're going to release that goes deeper into these, you know, oh, types great. of questions.
We can find you at Christ. Can you give us your social uh, media? Yeah, it's Christ, Christ, Christspiracy.com. Can I just say one, one more thing? Because I meant to say this a little. So you, you, you know, mentioned quite a few times restricted diet. I like to think of it as we talk about in the film is that we're part of this matrix that, that you were saying before. It's a systemic thing that's been brought in on us. Mm -hmm. We don't we don't really have a choice. And I feel it's better to be called it's a liberated diet because once you once mm. you make the connection and you liberate yourself from this matrix, you you liberate that 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 matrix. that that jaded person that's that was that hidden inside of you, and you liberate that and become free and connect to so much more and connect to that really inner child that has been just you know begging to come out. So I feel it's like more of a liberated diet. I meant to wanted to add that. Thank you. Yeah. It, it, the way you phrase things can really change things. I love the matrix. We're immersed <laughs> yeah. in a Italian Italian matrix I've been part of. Um, well, wow. I, I, I think everybody uh, listening live right now is excited to follow and to uh, um, wh where can we get the movie yeah, so, right now? Is it so, out? So, it's Christ. Follow us at Christ Spiracy on Instagram, Facebook, and then ChristSpiracy.com. We're going to be releasing the film on September 19th. So okay. mark your calendar, but definitely follow us on Instagram. We have tons of awesome content, side content that's that's educational to hilarious. Um, so it's a really fun um, page to follow. So ChristSpiracy.com and our Instagram and uh, it's probably September 19th. Well, Kip and Cam, I'm really appreciating what you do. Really appreciate to be on the show. I'm really glad to share this work with our whole audience and keep up the good work. Thank it's, you, it's inspirational. You touched my heart today. And like many other people here too, you you're uh, you're changing the world for for the better. Thank you so much. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste. Yeah. Namaste. Hope we hope we hope we get to meet in person sometime. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us live, and thanks to our big live live group here in Long Beach Island. Say hello, everyone. Mm -hmm. Hey 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 there. Thanks for everybody joining us. And remember, we're taking a group on pilgrimage to India and Nepal. Check out my website, Raghunath.yoga, because we're winding up the registration right now. So, uh, Kastuba, me, Mara, we're going to be there in India together. And then I'm taking a group with Mara to Nepal, trekking, going to holy places, singing, doing good, delicious vegan, vegetarian food the entire time. And um, yeah, it's just, it's one of those things that's sort of like paradigm shifting. I encourage everybody to check out this movie. I'm going to check out this movie when it comes out. I'm going to bring my kids. We're going to sit in front of that TV. We're all going to watch it. Thanks, everybody. A beautiful day for a beautiful day. Let the magic continue to flow in a big hairy bowl.